Watch this vidcast, or I'll gouge your eyes out. Welcome back, horror hounds, to Ghostman and Rivera's Horror Show podcast. I'm Miguel Pepino. And I am James Rivera. <laughs> or Jaime, depending on how you want to put it. We're saying that because we're going to be talking about a lot of Mexican horror this week. Well, but before we do that, we have to start with... Horror Show News. All right. So the trailer for Tom Six's The Onama Club drops. Tony Todd rumored to return as Candyman in Jordan Peele's produced sequel. Andre Overdahl to direct Dracula film The Last Voyage to Demeter for Amblin Partners. Stranger Things renewed for season four. The rights to Friday the 13th may signal a wave of many 80s slasher franchises being returned to their creators. Another nice little week of news. Yes. Always something happening. Hora. So recently we actually reported on the latest Tom Six film, The Onania Club, and it revolves around the theme of schadenfreude, which means taking the pleasure out of other people's misery. And we discussed on the podcast how it has people, the, the premise in the movie has people masturbating to tragedies such as 9-11 and other great catastrophes. And according to Tom Six, it is a social commentary on the ever-growing political correctness in the privileged Western world and the hypocrisy of that. The film, the film is going to be for sale at the upcoming AFM, which is the American Film Market in Santa Monica, California, this November. So he's going to try to get somebody to buy the rights to this. And, and I agree political correctness is, you know, a privileged Western world thing, and it is hypocritical. But I don't know if we need to see people masturbating to 9-11 to get the message across. <laughs> nor do I. Nor do I. I. I think this is a very odd approach to it. But hey, whatever works for him. And uh, we are actually going to watch that trailer on the podcast right now. This is trailer number two. The, the first trailer was very short, very visual. Just showed a bunch of ladies masturbating to, to the planes flying into the Twin Towers. This one there's a little bit is a little bit more. It's called a teaser, but... Yeah, it's it gives, a little bit longer than a teaser. It gives you a little more context. And here it is. The Onanya Club. Would you like to tell me why you're here today? I should have been so happy. So she's in Hollywood. I had it all. She looks like Lindsay Lohan. A happy, young, beautiful mother. With a terrible secret. With a terrible secret. She's going into a mysterious mansion. Come in. With a mysterious old lady. From Tom Six, that's what it says on the title cards. She's eating ominously and looking at torture in the background. That's some kind of medical footage. From the writer and director of the Human Centipede Trilogy. He lost his leg. He lost his leg. This girl's friend's telling her about a tragedy of her husband dying or something. She and goes she- to the math- bathroom to masturbate. Wow. Edgy. Ananya, it looks like a cult like symbol. Yeah. Here's a room full of rich looking women masturbating to disturbing images on television. Ugh, what's going on? A lot of pain and suffering I can see here. Yeah. Oh. Kelly Hancock. One of the one of the actresses from horror show. Come and see, see and come. <laughs> oh lord! Are they masturbating to a cancer patient? That's what it looks like. The Onania Club. Come. Well, with the premise like that, how could you resist it? Yeah, and the the premise sounds cheap, and the. The trailer looks cheap when it starts, but then by the end of the trailer, you think, okay, this might be a, a wild little interesting ride. Tom Six is a pretty interesting filmmaker. I'm not really the biggest fan of the Human Centipede films. However, even though I'm not a fan, the second Human Centipede is amongst the most disturbing films I've ever seen, and I had a hard time actually getting through it. So if nothing else, I expect to be thoroughly disturbed by the experience. Yeah, I appreciate... The first two Centipede films, I still haven't found the interest 
to watch part three yet. But the first two Centipede films, I, I respect them in their own right. The first one for being such a polished exercise in exploitation, but the second one is just just as grit, gritty and nasty as the first one is polished. Yeah. And that's, that's what I like about each one, that the first one is polished and brutal, and then the second one is just nasty and brutal. To say the least, I think I have more respect for Tom Six than I do enjoy his movies. However, I'm always up to see some fucked up shit. I like exploitation, so yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing when this gets a release date because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be playing in November, but like I said, this is at the American uh, film market, so this is a big event in Santa Monica, California, where a bunch of films are dis- are screened and a lot of distributors come to bid on films to see what they might be interested in distributing. So let's see who has the balls to distribute this one. <laughs> yeah, I have I have no doubt that a s- distributor is going to buy this. There's always a market for something like this. Yeah, but there's only a choice few. Like Unearthed Films, like Stephen Byro, he bought the rights to a, a Serbian film. So I, I can see him uh, getting in on this. Well, either way, I'm pretty sure it'll be a pretty interesting interesting film the next news story is this is just a rumor and we don't usually report on rumors but bloody disgusting is even talking about the rumor that tony todd is going to return as Candyman. now yaya abdul mateen the second is still going to lead the cast in the uh as Candyman. The film, yeah directed by nia da costa it is a spiritual sequel but this is only a rumor but we decided to go ahead and report it since it's being reported everywhere including bloody disgusting and it's going to re- be released June 12th, 2020. So we're probably going to have to wait to see it to see the extent of Tony Todd's involvement. Yaya Abdul Mateen is going to, the second is going to be playing Candyman, and Tony Todd's going to be playing Candyman 2. And this is a spiritual sequel, and Jordan Peele wrote this. I'm thinking Who maybe, knows what these guys are up to or what's going to happen? I'm thinking maybe it's like into the Spider Verse type of thing where there's ulti- uh, multiple Candymans. Candyman. So you get a younger Candyman and, and, and the classic Candyman. Uh, if nothing mm. else, it'll probably get more fans on board who are skeptical of the idea of doing a spiritual sequel or a reboot, as they say, to have some element of the beloved original carry on over into the new films. And Tony Todd was going to be a part of it from the beginning, but we're just now starting to hear that he might actually play a Candyman. Either way, I'm I'm pretty excited for this. I've always loved Candyman. That's one of my and we discussed it on our list of our our favorite horror films of the 1990s. Yeah, this is both Mike and I's one of our favorite films of the decade that it was released. Yeah, and I would be excited about this film even if Tony Todd wasn't involved. Mm-hmm. So just the fact that he's involved, I'm excited about that and. If he if he's actually makes an appearance as Candyman, even better. Stranger Things is now officially renewed for season four. I never we've heard a lot of talks about it being renewed. This might not be the last season. After all, a lot of them were they were talking for a while about making season four the last season. I'm pretty sure Netflix is going to want to milk this a little bit more, as seeing as it's the most popular thing that they've ever had. Yeah. The tagline for the new season is, "You're not in Hawkins anymore." Probably a 2021 release date, uh, according to most sources. And the scope of the series is said to open up. So I'm not going to say anything about the end of the third season. But it opens up a possibility of things happening beyond Hawkins. But how much more can you open that universe after season three? You can't go much bigger than that unless it's global. You never know. They might shock us. Because Stranger Things deals with things with... You know, I don't, supernatural is not quite the word, but science fiction, supernatural, the beyond, yeah. the unknown. So all the beyond and the unknown in that universe can't be confi- confined to one small town like Hawkins. There has to be more to it. So yeah. if they play that angle, they might have something good on their hands. And here's just my idea. Since these kids are getting older very rapidly, and they're at that age where one year makes a huge difference, Yeah. They, if they're going to do a season four and season five... They should have just renewed renewed it at the same time and shot them back to back if they're going to do that because it's going to become harder and harder because by 2021, if it, there's a fifth season in 2023, these kids are going to look like they're in their 20s. Yeah, there, there really has to be some time passage here between seasons to show, you know, and incorporate their aging into the story. That's the only way I could see it working. Or try to do the CG thing and uh, de-age them. Like, like in, in It. 
and the Irishman. Yeah, the Irishman, new Martin Scorsese. I liked the first season of Stranger Things. The second season, not as much, but I still enjoyed it. But I enjoyed the third season more than the second one. So it'll be interesting to see where they take it from here on out. I didn't think they'd be able to top the first season in second se- in the second season. I think they did, and then they did it again in season three. We'll be keeping you updated on all Stranger Things news. They've given me everything I've wanted so far, so I see no reason to doubt them from here on out. Yeah. Let's just hope this is the last two seasons, four and five, and they don't beat that dead horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andre Overdahl is directing a Dracula film, The Last Voyage of Demeter, for Amblin Partners. THR explains, Demeter was the name of the ship that transported Dracula from Transylvania to London in Bram Stoker's classic tale. In the 1897 novel, the ship washes up on the shores of England, tattered and broken, with one raving mad survivor. The script was written in 2002 by Braggy Shute. Oh, so this one took, fuck, eight, 17 years to get the script going off the ground? Yeah. That's pretty, that's a long time. I'm surprised that they stuck with it that long. This is pretty cool because that's always, in every version of Dracula, whether it's the Nosferatu's or the Bela Lugosi's or Bram Stoker's version, there's always that section of the film that's about tra- uh, Dracula traveling yeah. And there's always plague rats on the ship, and there's always only one stark, raving, mad, lunatic survivor at the end of it. Yeah. And it's only a portion of the film. It's yeah. always only a portion. There's a lot to be mined there. There's a whole story to be mined from just everything that happened on the ship. So instead of a typical Dracula film, I could imagine this is about be- people being plagued and dying and maybe yeah. vampire rats or something like that going on. I've always pictured what happened on that ship, and now we're going to get to see it. Andre Overdahl, he did uh, he did um, the recent scary stories to tell in the dark, yeah. and the excellent autopsy of Jane Doe. Yes, which is even better. Yes. I'm pretty confident that he can do something really good with this, and let's make sure it's rated R. No PG-13. Yeah. Not Dracula. But you know what it reminds me of? Uh, the Event Horizon. Mm-hmm. That oh yeah, tape the ship. where they show that everyone on the ship died. The whole crew was murdered, and then they see the little pieces of the tape that shows how they how that happened. So this kind of reminds me of that. They just need to pick a really good actor for Dracula because that's quite a role to fill. The next news story is the one that I find most interesting of everything that we dug up. The rights to the Friday the Thirteenth film. Uh, may signal a wave of 80 slasher franchises being returned to their creators. So, according to The Hollywood Reporter, in the late 1970s, the U.S. Congress amended the law to allow authors to grab back rights from studios after waiting a few decades. Until now, the termination provision has largely been exploited by musicians, not screenwriters. But records show a flurry of termination notices in the past year. Under law, they can come... 35 years after publication, which threatens to unsettle who owns the ability to make sequels and reboots of iconic films from the mid to late 80s. All right. This is going to be pretty interesting. So all the creator has to do is just give the studios a two-year notice before reclaiming their intellectual property. And this has been around since the 70s, but I imagine because it takes so long for it to go into effect... People are barely starting to practice or take advantage of it now. One of the most recent examples of this is West, the West Craven Estate recently got the rights back to A Nightmare on Elm Street. Victor Miller, who wrote the original Friday the, th- Friday the 13th, is actually in a legal dispute with Sean S. Cunningham's Horror, Inc. over the rights to the Friday the 13th film. Sean S. Cunningham is the director of the original Friday the 13th. Victor Miller is the writer. Yeah. But seeing as this intellectual property goes to creation, it's, I imagine Sean Cunningham is going to lose this one. And Stephen King has been doing this very quietly over the past few years. The Mist, The Dead Zone, Cujo, Children of the Corn, Creepshow, and Cat's Eye are all things that he's actually starting to gain access back to. He's starting to have the film rights for them. Yeah. Due to the two-year notices, movies like Pet Cemetery, like the Pet Cemetery remake, were rushed into production. So that's which explains, why it was such a disaster. Which explains a lot about that film. So I guess a couple years ago, Stephen King announced or told the studio that he was going to take back Pet Cemetery as is his legal right. So they had two years to do it, and the studio decided, fuck it, we got to take advantage of it, use it or lose it. So they produced that remake. The Terminator actually reverted back to James Cameron and Gail Ann Hurd, the original scriptwriters, hence why we are getting a new Terminator film from directly produced by James Cameron with a story by James Cameron. Uh, other franchises referring back are going to be Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Predator, 
and Beetlejuice. Um, I like this because this is going to open the doors for creators to uh, reclaim the classic franchises and start making cool movies again. Not fucking cash grabs. Yeah. Not just a sequel where everything is studio mandated, where they want the same thing over. Creators are going to be able to do whatever the fuck they want with their original stories. So as far as I'm concerned, this is fantastic news for horror. So the, the original, the rights don't automatically revert back to the original creator. They have to claim it, and then they have to wait that two years. Yeah, but I guess at the 33-year mark, <clears throat> you could start getting prepared and let them know that come 35th anniversary, yeah. this is mine again. I that, never even knew such a law existed. Yeah, I didn't either. And this is really good because there's way too much of rights floating around Hollywood and somebody getting a hold of it and just... The worst killing propri- the shit out of a the, franchise. The worst proprietors of this for years were Dimensions Films, where they would just fucking take every franchise and try to revive it just so they could have the rights to every fucking genre franchise and fucking it up yeah. over and over with studio mandated films. Finally, it's going to be broken free of that. It's going to cause a new wave of remakes and reboots, but hopefully, since these are creator oriented and they're more uh, and they're more in line with the original vision that they're going to be a much better spate of remakes and reboots than we are currently getting at the moment so this could also count for writers who wrote something back then and you know that many years ago and then it was just bought by the studios and then just not anything done with it just because they wanted to put a similar idea into production so even those long lost scripts could resurface yes so this is going to open up a lot of floodgates and it's going to change it's going to be uh, change things. The only thing that might complicate it in a few cases, this mostly pertains to the US, US rights, international rights are a whole other thing. So but usually when a film is produced in the US, uh, international distributors don't really have much of a say yeah. in how the film is being made. They're just there to distribute it. So that shouldn't affect it as too much as far as creativity. Yeah. But it looks like a lot of these franchises are going to be going back to their original creators. There's yeah, too many studios screwing up these content creators uh, vision. Yep. I'm sick of it. The chickens are coming home to roost studios. Yes. Watch it. Watch. You're listening to Ghost Man and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. All right, so Mike and I watched a lot this week. We watched a, g- a good amount of films, but before we get, launch into the films that we want to talk about, Mike has to, is here to report back on the Creep Show series. Oh, that's right. You haven't seen it yet, huh? No, I have not seen it. Uh, we have been reporting on the Creep Show series coming out, and we even reported Grey Matter and House of the Head were going to be the first two stories. Mm-hmm. I watched it, first of all, Excellent animated opening sequence. It captures the feel of Creep Show, the energy. Gray Matter is a nice little short. It's uh, it stars Adrian Barbeau and Tobin Bell. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about a boy who has an abusive father, but it takes a lot of time telling a very familiar story. It unfolds in a way that's kind of shaky. Character interactions aren't really believable at times, and then it's a really depressing story that takes too long to get to the horror, but fucking amazing payoff. Really? Yeah, so I can't complain too much. It's just, you know, one episode, two shorts, but they both seem to run long. Like um, the second... Even though they only amount to 20 minutes or 22 minutes apiece, right? Yeah, exactly. Th- that's Interesting. What's, that's what's frustrating to me about it. You could pack a little uh, cool little story, especially if you have one that's a, a pre-existing story like Grey Matter, which is from Stephen, Stephen King's King. Night Shift. Mm-hmm. They could have really flushed that out and made it good, but it seems like a lot of character development... And then nothing happens with that development because it's such, it's, you have to have your punchline, you have to have your climax. How are the effects? We're going. Oh, the the effects are great, uh, largely practical. If there was any CG, I I didn't really notice it. That's good to hear. Yeah. And then the the second story was House of the Head. It was starting, starring Kaylee Fleming. She's Judith from the Walking Dead series. And it was, it was definitely better than the first one, even though it had less star power. Even though Greg Nicotero directed the first one? Yeah. Oh, interesting. The second one was better, but even that one seemed to go a little long. Like, the the premise is this this little girl has a dollhouse, mm-hmm. and then this little severed head, like a zombie head, appears in the dollhouse, and then it starts moving around the house, and she sees the aftermath of it killing the other little figures in her... In her uh, oh, I like the premise. Uh, yeah. I like the premise. That sounds pretty interesting. So it's a cool premise. Another one, with, you know... It was decent, had a great payoff, but it just seemed overly long. It's, it seemed to, it didn't flush out the story well. You know? But was it fun? Yeah, definitely fun to watch. I mean, the the gripes I have are 
are minor. It just seemed to go a little long, but it's, you know, it's still great for a first episode. All right. Well, I mean, it, like I said, that's only the first episode and the show has uh, still has time to develop as it goes along. Yeah. Are all the episodes are going to be are they going to be split up with like like this where it's like two basically two short films per episode? I'm pretty sure that's what it's, that's what it's going to be. Yeah. It's an interesting format. Yeah, well, it opens up more possibilities too. Yeah, but I, I looked on IMDb and, and they have it just a mess with the way they have it entered. You you can't even tell. So you looked it up on IMDb? Yeah, but it was scattered everywhere. The way they have they have it entered, you can't even tell what they have a list of stories, but mm-hmm. you can't tell which one goes in which episode. They don't even have it entered properly yet. Ah, uh, they might be doing that on purpose to surprise audiences. That's true. I'll be checking it out soon and hopefully. I'll report back my feelings my feelings about the series as well. Listen to this podcast, or I'll gut you. We went to an awesome little event that our friend Secret Sergio put on. He invited yes. a few of us over to Noche de los Murcilagos Mexicanos. Murcilagos Mexicanos. Which was a night of Mexican horror and an exploration of the cultural relevance of the genre. Sergio is one of our friends who's very into horror films like us, and we go to events with him a lot, and he has a very vast knowledge of horror and it, it was pretty cool he actually introduced uh, all the films and gave us a little history and breakdown of each one yeah i've i've uh, i've even hosted similar movie nights like this before but it's it never works out the way that sergio did it yes like he he set the mood he had the the drinks and the snacks he had uh horror films going on on tv while horror soundtracks were playing on vinyl he got up between each movies. film he got up between each film and told stories about it and told stories about the relevance of mexican horror and it he was told a great he gave night. us a little history of mexican horror throughout the centuries and how it pertains to each film that he showed us and he kicked off the night by showing us quite a gem that I've heard about for a few years, but it finally took me a while to get around seeing it. Another version of the 1931 Dracula. This one in Spanish with a Mexican director, stars, and crew. Yeah, so and it was Dracula. Dracula. And it was impressive as fuck. Dare yes, I say it it's better than the Bela Lugosi Hollywood version. Yes, it was. I'm still partial to Bela Lugosi's performance. I think Bela Lugosi is a more sinister Dracula than what we get in the Mexican version. Because Carlos Villarias played Conda Dracula. But he did make a very seductive vampire. I'll give him that. He definitely had a lot of sex appeal. His expressions were awesome. His delivery was awesome. His look was great. I love all the little expressions that he had. Some of them were even hilarious. So I guess this was common back in back in the early early days of sound when uh, silent pictures had just ended. Universal Studios was known in the 1920s and 30s for being a big producer of horror movies, and they would uh, they would film a Hollywood version of every movie. And to maximize their profits, once the day of shooting was done, they would allow in either a, f- a French film crew, a German film crew, or a Mexican film crew to come in to use the same sets, same script, same studio, same everything to make the exact same movie in a different language. Yeah. So this literally has all the same sets as the uh, the Bela Lugosi version of Dracula, yeah, and but it looks fucking better. And as Sergio explained, it actually looks better than the original Dracula because they would film after the first after the the Americans would film during the day, so they would get to watch their dailies, and then adjust the lighting techniques for optimum results. So it actually looks better and a richer look and feel. The than cinematography the is much more dreamlike. There's more clarity to it. Yeah. There's more beauty in the shots. You get to see... I mean, the sets always really looked good in the Bela Lugosi version of Dracula and Todd Browning's. Don't get me wrong. They, they, they're great sets. Yeah. But with the way that it's shot in this one, you get a better look at everything. You get a better sense of everything. Yeah, there's more detail, more depth. Kind of a cheat, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You get to see all the fuck-ups, the mistakes, and say, okay, they did this wrong, they did this wrong, so we're going to come in at night and do it better. And even the acting was better. Oh, yeah. Because the the delivery of American cinema actors in the 30s 
was kind of deadpan. It, 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 it was kind of a, it came straight from like the they theater. Were, they were used to being in plays and being in the theater, so they it was had very a, to over enunciate things, you know. Like in the orig- in the Todd Browning Dracula, Bella Lugosi seems like he's in a different movie from the rest of the actors that are yeah. in there. Everybody else plays it just like every American actor does exactly. back then, and I think that's because Bella Lugosi was Hungarian, so that uh, that flavor that he brought to it elevated that film. And kind of makes the other performances look goofy. I love that movie. Don't get me wrong. It's still quite enjoyable. This one comes from a much different tradition of actors. And they don't have that American kind of thing going on. So yeah. other, even though I prefer Bella Lugosi, the cast across the board is so much better in the Mexican version. It's, it's less melodramatic. It's more believable. It's more realistic. I feel like the characters have more, I don't know, there's more depth to the face the, yeah. the facial expressions it's not so exaggerated and ah oh, gee whiz golly gee shucks that old type of movie style acting before brando came in, in the 50s and showed that hey there's a camera right there you don't have to mug for it you can yeah. the camera can capture a lot of subtleties that that you couldn't get through on a stage on a stage the reason a lot of those films were like that is a lot of american films in the early days took stage actors and those stage actors have to be grand and dramatic because they have to project to a really big audience in order for everybody to feel they're in an intimate setting and i feel like a lot of foreign filmmakers or filmmakers that are not or at not filmmakers actors that are not american came to the realization a lot quicker that a camera could pick up a lot more subtleties yeah. than a stage than than a stage ever could. The real star for me of this film is uh, Pablo Alvarez Rubio who played Renfeld. He acted his ass off in that movie much better than the original run. Oh yeah, it's more believable. And don't forget Lupita Tovar as as Eva. as Eva. Oh man, she was fucking fantastic in the Beautiful. movie. Beautiful. The directors are George Melford Melford and Enrique Tovar Avalos. I've been meaning to see this for years, so thank you, Secret Sergio, for thank you, Secret Sergio, it and and making such a great presentation out of it. It was lost for years. A big chunk of it, well, a big chunk of it was lost for years. That that's why it was never released as a movie. It wasn't really long enough. Mm-hmm. And then finally, they tracked down the lost footage and put it together and released it. If you get a chance to watch it, you'll notice. You'll be able to see the difference. You'll be able to tell which of the footage is lost. When you look at it, the quality of the film stock is a little bit more degraded in the scenes that they had to find and restore, and there's a notable difference. It doesn't really actually take you out of the movie. If anything, it makes it look cooler. It and I looks, like still looks good. It still looks good, mm-hmm. and I kind of like that it looks like that because I we, you can identify what was missing for years and what was incomplete and why you would not have been able to have shown this film in its proper context without all of that uh, without all that extra stuff thrown right back in hi i'm elliot you're listening to ghost man and rivera's horror show podcast between the features after we watched dracula we watched eligante a short film t- from 2014 it's a 14 minute canadian short film actually but it's spanish language it's directed by gigi saul guerrero and co-directed by Luke Bramley. If you're familiar with Mexican culture, you know the luchadors, the the all of the the wrestlers. How it's a big part of Mexican culture, and those are Mexican heroes. Yeah. This really flips that idea on its head, and almost gives you a hillbillyish version of a luchador, a psychotic hillbilly. It's about a guy who's just trying to make a better life for himself. So he crosses the U.S. Mexican border in the USA, and then he's kidnapped, and then he wakes up with a luchador. Uh, mask sewn to his neck and he has to fight this big gigante it's almost like gigante seems like if the family from texas the texas chainsaw massacre raised a mexican luchador that's yeah. what would come out because <laughs> the fam the family was gathered around the ring all rabid and ravenous violent for the, for the and, violence oh yeah and it's only 14 minutes like michael pointed out but within 14 minutes it really gets under your skin very fast, yeah. very rapidly. So it was actually a good little segue in between the two films that we watched. 
It was actually pretty depressing for me because I really felt for that guy. Mm -hmm. And he really didn't get a break throughout the whole damn thing. <laughs> yeah, and that's why it kind of flips the idea of the luchador as a hero right on its head when it does that. It needed to be that way for the message to get across, but it was still depressing for me. I, I still, not enough for me not to like it. I still liked it, but it was really depressing because I connected with, with that character. It's definitely worth seeking out. Where could we watch this film, actually? Where could our audience watch this film? I do believe Eligante is on Amazon Prime. Yes, yes, Amazon Prime. So if you want to check that out, check it out on Amazon Prime. For the audience members, L-E-L, -L, and then Gigante, G-I-G-A-N-T-E. Just in case yeah. there's somebody out there who doesn't know how to spell it and they want to look it up. It's only 14 minutes of your life. You won't regret it. And that family member with the yellow teeth was the scariest Ew. part of it. Gross, yeah. <laughs> like chiclet teeth, <laughs> like little Cheetos. The uh, the movie he finished the night off with, I, I take some kind of responsibility for this. We both, that have great. To we, we both have to take responsibility for this one. Because uh, Sergio presented us with a handful of Santo films. If you're not familiar with Santo, he's uh, he's Santo. another he's another um, luchador, and he was a Mexican superhero, and he'd done a whole string of movies. And he he offered us these movies and said, "You guys pick one." So we picked Santo and Blue Demon versus Doctor Frankenstein, which translates to Santo y Blue Demon contra el Doctor Frankenstein. It wasn't that good, but there were things that I liked about it. But Mike and I, he gave us a, the choice, but Mike and I selected this one. I think mainly because we were in the mood for another classic, uh, you know, like the classic old, old movie monsters like Dracula. Frankenstein was just seemed like a natural extension or a perfect double feature. Yeah. We probably should have checked out the zombie one. <laughs> yeah. Well, th this one was like a detective movie, and then they jump in the ring and wrestle. And it's really good wrestling. I, that, that was that's probably I the best thing about it is the wrestling. Yeah, that's the part I liked about it the most. Because both these guys, Santo and Blue Demon, they're both really excellent wrestlers. And they both had a rivalry with each other yeah. at the time. And despite the rivalry, or despite the fact that they didn't really get along, they still came together to make movies for bankability and to and to just ride that wave of popularity. I always found that very interesting that they're luchadores, that they're wrestlers, but they make horror films where they face yeah. off of any number of classic horror villains. Yeah, so it, even though this wasn't great, I, I did have fun with it. And it did make me want to go back and watch the better more, ones. More of the El Santo films? For sure, yeah. It was entertaining. I, I, I want to see that concept in a better film. Definitely. But uh, another cool little story that Sergio told us about this film, Santo actually never took off his mask in public for his entire 48-year career. And he finally did late in life and died eight years later. Eight days. Eight days later. Sorry. Eight days, yeah. He used to travel on separate planes from all of his crew... So yeah. nobody could see what he looked like. Pretty incredible because I don't think you could pull that off anymore in this day and age with social yeah. media and cameras and technology any, everywhere. Yeah. It would be very difficult to pull off that illusion and never have the public know what you look like. Maybe he knew he was going to pass on or he knew his time was coming, yeah. which makes sense why he would finally show his face to the public. Well, it's one of the reasons why he's such a legend in mm -hmm. Mexico, you know. Yeah. So I definitely have to see more of these Santo movies, and and I guess uh, Santo y Blue Santo. Demon, Santo y Blue Demon, but they have other movies together too where they fight Dracula. We should have saw the Dracula one. Ah, oh well. So that was our night at Secret Sergio's house. We really enjoyed it, Sergio. Yes, thank you, Sergio. You educated us and brought in our perspective on horror. Listen to this podcast, or I'll cut your nose off. And feed it to my goldfish. We also, we'll, we'll discuss it later on in the podcast, but we also watched a movie that Sergio recommended that we had been meaning to watch, but uh, we finally watched it after his recommendation was Tigers Are Not Afraid. But first we're going to discuss... No, the movie was One Cut of the Dead. Huh? One Cut of the Dead. Oh, yeah, that's the... Yeah, he, he suggested One Cut of the Dead, but we also watched... Tigers Are Not Afraid, which is a Mexican horror film, which was why I got confused. <laughs> yes, but we're going to continue and we're going to talk about Tigers Are Not Afraid before we go on to Sergio's recommendation for us. <clears throat> and so Tigers Are Not Afraid is directed by Isa Lopez. Superbly fucking directed. Oh my God, it was so good. I feel like when I watched it, I saw a modern day classic unfurling before our before my eyes it's like this generation's version of pan's labyrinth it, it had the classic feel from the very first scene and it never let up until the last frame 
Just a warning for anybody out there. A lot of people will watch horror movies to escape harsh reality or to escape, you know, just to have fun. If that's the type of horror movie that you're looking for, this might not be for you. Even though it has fantastic fa fantasy elements and it's a ghost story and it's very supernatural, it's all grounded in a very realistic and very heartbreaking story. Yeah. It revolves around a group of children living in Mexico and they live in a town that is a small, poor town that has been taken over by the cartel. And a lot of these children, their parents have been kidnapped by the cartel. Their parents are t kidnapped or tortured. So it's a bunch of it's a group of kids that are left to fend for themselves, and they're forced to grow up really fast amidst harsh, harsh conditions. So definitely, you get that Pan's Labyrinth or Guillermo del Toro feel, almost also comparable to The Devil's Backbone, yeah. because it's a very beautiful fantasy story with. Um, amazing ghost story with great horror in it but it all takes place amongst a very harsh and depressing reality that is not fun and the horror comes from the main character being followed and tormented by these ghosts that were created by this war that they're living in the middle of yes and it's, it's another interesting thing about it is the ghosts are not the ones that are sinister in the movie i mean i take that back they are they're sinister they're very sinister but they're not the bad intention the yeah, bad they, they guys don't have sinister intentions they look and sound and feel, feel sinister, sinister <laughs> but their intentions are not sinister the bad guys all come in the human form uh, in the form of cartel and it's a very eye-opening film if you don't know what goes on what goes on down there in mexico yes it's really heartbreaking the the level of brutality that these children have to live through is really unspeakable. Children get shot by grown adults. They get uh, kidnapped, tossed in cages. Yeah. Their organs are sold on the black market. So these kids are murdered, tortured. Their parents are taken from them. So this is not a, this is a very heavy film in a lot of ways. It deals with child agony, child death, and a lot of pain. But yeah. it grounds it in a horror story that I found inspiring it the it's a movie that really broke my heart but by the uh, i'm getting a little emotional thinking about it it yeah. broke my heart but by the end of it i felt very um i felt very hopeful about it. i felt very hopeful it's a very uh, i don't even know how to put this into words even though a lot of bad stuff happens in this movie and it's very negative it gives you hope that you can rise above the situation and survive yeah. and come out a better person at the end of the day and that's what really hit me about the movie is i don't want to spoil how it ends but the movie ends with a speech that when i recall i actually started getting a little emotional thinking about it it really really knocked me for a loop well i wear my emotions on my sleeve and i'm very susceptible to the magic of film mm -hmm. and this film was very magical from start to finish and I was emotional at the end, but it, I wasn't overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And then when the credits start, started rolling, I just became overwhelmed with emotion. And just, just looking back at the experience I just had of watching that film. And uh, uh, Paula Lara played Estrella. And oh my God, what a phenomenal performance. Her and uh, Juan Ramon Lopez, who played El Chine. El Chine, yeah. Oh, man. Just, and these were kids with no prior acting experience whatsoever. They looked through like 600 kids or something like that and found these who had no experience and they had to go through an improv class and a workshop just to make the movie. And I didn't see one frame of that movie where they were not believable. There's not one false note in any of the child actors and that makes this an even more impressive, uh, a more impressive achievement for Issa Lopez yeah. is because children are very hard to direct. It's very hard to get certain type of performances in them because a lot of acting, especially in a story that's this emotional, a lot of actors have to draw upon real life experience that comes from growing older and being an adult and going through heartbreak and different things. A lot of kids, a lot of children don't have that in yeah. them because they don't possess the life experience to understand. They don't have the empathy because they don't have the life experience to back that up. I would never know it from watching these kids' performances, though. They were genuinely believable. None of them seemed like actors. These just sent, seemed like children who are tr doing the best they can in the face of something unbelievable and unspeakable. And that's a testament to what a great director Issa Lopez is, that she could get this... It's almost the whole cast is kids. Yeah. And just a couple of villains were adults. 
So every bit of screen time is taken up by these kids, and you believe all of them from the two stars to all the supporting characters. They're all very believable, and it felt like they went through things like that before because she didn't just elicit great performances out of these kids. She elicited a wide range of emotions, especially from those two main characters. Could you seen a lot on screen that wasn't actually flushed out in the dialogue. You just seen it in their faces and their act. The pain in their face, you could read the, the facial expressions. And it um, there's I can't think of a single flaw in this movie. And what's more impressive is this movie is only 83 minutes long. It's an hour and 23 minutes, yeah. including credits. And it does not feel that short. It feels a lot longer than that. That A lot of people might interpret that as an insult. I consider it a compliment. Because by the end of the film, I felt like I had been, I'd seen so much more than just yeah. an hour and 20 minutes. I felt like I was taken on an emotional journey. I saw a very fleshed out story. I got to spend a lot of time with the characters. I got to swim in the atmosphere of the movie. And I got a sense of what these kids' lives are and what they have to go through and the heartbreak that they have to live through. Yeah. And can I just say something else? I'm. Uh, we've always talked about it. I'm not a fan of CGI. I'm, I don't dig it. It's not my thing. Yeah. This is a fantastic use of CGI in this very movie. Very organic and subtle. There's nothing about the CGI in this film that I have any complaints uh, complaints about at all. It all works in its favor. This is one of those rare cases where a filmmaker can take CGI and use it to its best effect without making it look dumb or yeah. fake. And that's another. Th uh, that's also proof of how talented Issa Lopez is. That she can work with child actors. She can make CGI look really great. She can involve you in a story. She can scare you, and she can give a gut punch in your give you a gut, an emotional gut punch at the end of it all. Yeah, and she has made movies before, but mostly comedies. And she considers this her first real big break, and she's 48 years, years old. And you know what? What's interesting is if you watch this film, there's nothing about it that you would look and think, oh, this director is a comedian, or they have no. their background in comedy. There's not a trace of that at all. I mean, there's tiny moments of humor, like a little bit here and there, but it's a fairly bleak film, but it's not nihilistic. Yeah, uh, it's bleak, but it's hopeful and it's inspiring. And th this film puts a spell on you like few movies can. Not just horror. Mm -hmm. This put a spell on me. I was transfixed and hyper focused on every aspect of it, for every bit of it. And I was, I watched it when I was burned out. We had been filming and editing all day, and for my, like thirteen or fourteen hours straight. Yeah, my brain was fried. I didn't feel like I was going to be able to focus on it. I thought I was going to have to rewatch it to to really grasp it today, but. Oh my god, I just complete my mind and soul woke up. This is a film that I recommend that anybody see, not just horror fans, but if you love movies in general, believe us when we tell you this film is truly something special. Yeah. This is something that people are going to look back on years from now and it's going to be regarded as a classic. If yeah. you love Guillermo del Toro, this is for you. And it's it's not a cheesy horror film. It's no, not, it's not a melodramatic uh, art house horror film. It's just a really great, riveting fucking story with horror elements and fantastical elements. And I love the the score. It was atypical. It was beautiful. It was haunting. And it, I I just I love when a score hits all the right beats, mm -hmm. but then surprises you sometimes too, where. That score doesn't quite fit that scene. It's not quite the traditional way you'd go with the score, but oh my god, it's so effective. Yes. That's what I look for in a proper score, and that this one had an awesome one. I love the uh, graffiti animation. Oh, that was great, too. Oh, that was beautiful. That was another bit of CGI that was very effective. And then the, All the uh, CGI was effective in yeah. this. And then the styrofoam cup with the finger in it. Oh, yeah. That was awesome. It was chilling. It, yeah, I got good goosebumps right now. It was chilling here, those whispers coming from it, and then the Estrella's uh, reactions to it. Oh, phenomenal. And then the, the, the kids painting their dead friends on the walls with the white eyes. That was heartbreaking and beautiful at the same time, where every like a new kid died, so they went and painted his picture on the wall. And then when that kid died, and then uh, he appears to Estrella, and he says, they're burying me, I'm cold. I got chills thinking oh. about that scene. <laughs> I'm going to cry like a baby. <laughs> but oh. it's, it's a movie that just fires on all cylinders. It's beautifully filmed, beautifully acted. 
written with great soul and great feeling and there's not a false note and it's a marvel of storytelling because of the economy of storytelling to be able to fit that much emotion that much drama that much horror that much surrealism that much fantasy in such a compact amount of time and never once did it feel felt rushed i felt like the movie was taking its time the entire fucking way so i couldn't believe that could not have been 80 minutes long no not a, and just such a such an achievement as for for Issa Lopez such a great film, I I fucking love it. I think it's a borderline masterpiece, if not one outright. So once again, one of my favorite films of 2019 comes late in the year, and it, it's actually a 2017 film, but it just made its festival rounds and just tore it up on the festival circuit before finally reaching in us. the public. Yes. So you can check this out on Shutter. And this is another uh, kudos to Shudder for getting in on having access to such great original content. Yeah. and I- Two excellent 2019 foreign horror films we watched this week were Shudder exclusives. Yes. So everybody out there, please, please go out and watch Tigers Are Not Afraid. You won't regret it. Definitely. I love it. You're listening to Ghost Man and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. The other movie that we watched was another Shutter exclusive, like Mike, Michael said. This one is an Asian horror film called One Cut of the Dead. It was written and directed by Shinichiro Yuida. This is a very tricky movie to talk about. Yeah. Because I don't want to reveal too much. It's a Japanese horror film, zombie it, film. It's a Japanese horror zombie film. And that genre has been done so many t- so many times over and over that I always marvel when you can recreate something original from yeah. a zombie film. This really takes the cake for originality as far as zombie movies go. I said yeah. uh, a while back that the uh, the girl with all the gifts was probably the most original take on a zombie on on the zombie genre in a long time, possibly since George Romero. Yeah. I would say this even tops that. As yeah. a piece of originality, as a piece of filmmaking, it's absolutely fucking stunning. This is a fantastic feat of filmmaking. What they pull off, what they achieve on a low limited budget is unbelievably impressive. The technical aspects of this movie are 100% sound. The way yeah. that the camera moves, the way that it feels as a piece of cinema, the camera angles, what you see, what you don't see is what's most effective about this movie. The movie knows when to cut away from something that you want to look at yeah. and show you something else while you hear it going, and it'll keep it going and going and going, and it starts to build the sense of tension where you find yourself almost leaning forward in your seat and looking through, almost scanning the frames as if you think you could see beyond what's going on in the camera. The way that it fixes your view only on certain things works so well to its benefit. And this film was shot in, what, eight days? Yeah. Eight fucking days? Eight days? I can't believe that. And it's it's found footage, but it's not. It's a zombie film, but it's it's not. not. It's an all one-shot film, but it's not. (laughs) <laughs> it's there's so much more to this movie and like I said I can't even begin to parse out what this movie actually is other than the fact that it is a true original and when I say it's a true original in ev- in, in every sense of the word it's as as original as uh Loose which is another yeah. film that we talked about I was speaking about this I believe a couple weeks ago about how it's so hard to find something as original as that this definitely falls under that category of originality of oh, wow, I've never actually seen a movie like this. This movie has a fantastic first 30 minutes, and then the movie goes further, and it makes you look at everything that came before in a completely different light, in a way that has you smacking your head, going like, duh, why didn't I think of that before? Why didn't I think... This movie plays tricks with your perception of what you're watching. It, It almost made me feel foolish for criticizing it for the first half, because I'm like, oh, that shot went on too long. That girl's screaming a little bit too long. They're obviously preparing the next shot off camera. That must be a mistake. And then all oh, that lady jumped into frame. But that you must know, be a mistake. Or that that's uh, the beheading gag. Yeah. They, oh, they're just pointing the, oh, the camera away so they can set up the body. And, and then you end up feeling foolish and for you know criticizing it. What's kind of weird is that even though there's all those little mistakes... It doesn't interrupt the flow or the feel of the movie. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't mess with momentum yeah. at all. 
it like it's 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 weird because it's so involving and it's so visceral that your your brain will register a strange flaw but completely overlook it because yeah. what you're seeing is so exciting and so unprecedented that you don't really have time to give a shit that long or yeah. care. You kind of register like, oh, that's weird, but whatever. By the time your brain is done processing that, the movie is showing you something different that you're like, ooh, what's this? Yeah. What's that? There were moments that had me going, what the fuck was that? What was going on? But not in a bad way. In a way that was very mysterious it made me it, it kept me involved in the film it has a little bit has, it shifts at a lot of points it changes and the movie is constantly changing what it is and every time you think you know what it is it's it's very uh effective for what it is at that point and then it becomes something very different and then it's effective at what it is then it does a great job of playing with audience perception of constantly shifting and this is another one this movie's only an hour and a half an hour and 36 minutes in that uh short amount of time i can't count how many times my perspective and my idea of the film has shifted where my opinion of the movie kept changing as the movie went along and by the time it was over i looking i clapped a little bit in my seat yeah i was just clapping i was like bravo what yeah. a fucking fantastic little feat of filmmaking that they, that, that this crew pulled off, that these and filmmakers, that these actors, and all the actors are good. Yeah. All the actors are good across the board. And the, uh, it was actually, it's a Japanese film, it has a $25,000 budget, which it, it looks like it has more than that. Uh, part of it was shot in two days with six takes, and you'll see what I'm talking about when you watch it. It's pretty impressive. But most of the cast was paid. Uh, they actually paid to be in it. They weren't even paid to be in it. They actually paid for this seminar, which was the fight. It's the, so the movie is the final product of an acting and directing workshop, like a little seminar. So that's the culmination of it. And the fact that they could come and you could feel that too. It feels like filmmakers gathering together and making a movie about filmmakers. So think this is the premise for the film. Things go badly for a hack director and film crew shooting a low-budget zombie movie in an abandoned World War II Japanese facility when they are attacked by real zombies. So this is a very intriguing film. Yeah. What a ride this was. So we got to see some really, really good films this year. And 2019 is shaping up to be a really good year for horror films. I feel that um, Tigers Are Not Afraid and One Cut of the Dead are very innovative horror films. They're very fresh. Even though they take concepts that are kind of familiar, you might have seen movies that are kind of like it, and it spins it in a way that you're like, oh, I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah. So 2019, as far as horror is concerned, is shaping up to be a very unique year because it's taking tried, tried and true genres like the Possession film with Luz and the zombie film with One Cut of the Dead, and the Guillermo del Toro style ghost story mixed with realism yeah. with Tigers Are Not Afraid and giving you completely new, fresh perspectives and angles. 2019 is the year of hor is the year that we are learning that within these very confined subgenres, you can find endless creativity and completely new angles that you never would have thought of before. It's a year that I feel like it's pushing the boundaries of what horror could be yeah. our perceptions of what horror films could be are being ch are, are really being changed by the slate of films that we're starting to see as the end of the year goes on and i hope this keeps going all the way to the end of the year one thing that does give me hope is um robert eggers upcoming the lighthouse oh yeah we saw another trailer from it it's only like a 30 second trailer and god that movie looks unlike anything i've ever seen before I could already tell, even though I haven't seen it, and this may be an early judgment call, it looks like we have a masterpiece on our hands, yeah. and it looks like nothing I've ever seen before. It every, looks like it's going to change how you look at Every trailer looks better and better, and every trailer is like, I want to watch it again and again and again. Just to be get a grasp on the imagery and everything yeah. that you see. Just get a little taste of what I'm in for, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm very happy with this year in horror films. Well, if you listen to the podcast, you heard me. It was maybe a couple months ago. I was complaining about 2019 so far. Like I didn't like any of the movies I had seen so far. And ever since I said that, I've been putting my foot in my mouth week after week. There's been one or more every excellent, week excellent releases every fucking week, and it still keeps going. I, I'm loving this 
horror renaissance. It, I, I thought it was dying down, but bam, last half of 2019 is kicking ass. I feel like this is a great time to be a horror fan because you've never, we've never had so much innovation yeah. come along within a very short span of time. And it's never been so popular. It's never been so mainstream. Mm -hmm. So now you're seeing so much more uh, big budget horror films and you're seeing even a lot more smaller budget horror films because when these big blockbuster horror films do wor have worldwide success, it's not just them having success. It trickles down all the way to the smallest guys, all the way down to us. Yes. And I think that's one of the reasons why Horror Show is so successful on American Horrors because this renaissance of horror, more and more People fans are, are rabid for horror. are interested in it right now. In all its forms. Yes. And we're getting it. Yeah. So if you watched our recent, uh, our, if you watch our television series, which is a, a horror show, Pickles Horror Show, which airs on the American Horrors Roku channel, also available at AmericanHorrors.com and every, StrictlyStreaming.com. Every Friday. Every Friday night uh, with encores on Sunday. Yeah. We just aired our Ghost Man and Rivera special. We showed a couple of short films that we hope you enjoy. These are we took in a couple submissions. Yes. One of them was for a short forty-five second horror movie called Discovery. God damn, I loved it. Yeah, it's such a good. It's there's no story in it at all, but within thirty seconds you are creeped out by just what you see. It's just the image imagery combined with the sound is really creepy. So if you missed that on our show on Friday, check it out on Sunday night. Sometime between six, nine, six and nine p.m. Yeah. However, that uh, 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 central. Yeah. So, and however that translates to wherever you're at, check it out. And we also uh, aired another short film called Puppy Dog Tales. That was a longer, more uh, a full-on narrative feature, yeah. and it's a very. Well, I'm not going to ruin it, but it's a very cool little horror film with a very little creepy vibe going on in it. And this one's from the UK. Yes. And we had uh, we hadn't got very many submissions in the first season, and we had to get friends that we knew f who were filmmakers to submit their films. And then season two came around, and I and I put out another uh, notice, and didn't get many responses. And then. Once the episodes actually started coming out in season two, we just got a flood of a few of them, and it just so happens that these first few were just, just fucking phenomenal. So, um, as you can tell, Mike and I are very, very enthusiastic and in love with the horror genre, and we like to share that love with other people. So, if you have some short films that you're interested in, you want, you think they, you think they're good, you really like them, you want to see if they can get maybe broadcast on a show. Send them to Stone Canvas Pictures at Yahoo.com. Again, that's Stone Canvas Pictures at Yahoo.com. Send us your short film submissions. We'll watch them. There's no guarantee that they might make it on the show because who knows how many submissions we could get or how yeah. many, like, depending on all the quality. But send them into us, and if we like them, we're going to put them on our show on one of our monthly special, and we'll talk about it. We'll give you a shout out, and we'll tell people where to follow you or where they could see your work at. So yeah, it's it, a good little platform if you're trying to get a little boost out there and you want a little uh, more people to see your work. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the budget is. No matter yeah, we don't what, care about any of that. What year you created it, anything. If, if there's some work that you have, some horror work that you have that you want to showcase, we want to show yeah. it on the show and we want to give you a voice. Yes, it could be anywhere from 15 seconds long to 15, fuck it, 20 minutes long. If it's that good, it's, we try not to go for that long, but if it's that fucking good, send it in. Yeah, cause send it in and we'll show you. Luckily, we'll show it. Luckily, we're on a channel that lets us do whatever the fuck we want, so we can make the episodes as long as we want. Like this one's another one-hour episode. I don't know how the hell we pulled a one-hour episode out of our ass, and I don't know how we're pulling off this season two, but damn it, we're doing it so far. <laughs> and if you enjoy listening to this podcast, you really need to check out these specials on our show, like the one we we're just talking about, because we actually air highlights from the podcast, video highlights, because yeah. we don't put this on YouTube and you normally can't see it. But if you tune into our specials, we have highlights from our podcast. And on this one, we actually uh, put 20 minutes worth of of episode 40 of our podcast our interview with the channel creator Hart D Fisher. Yeah. Very fascinating interview. If you want to take a look at how that went, watch the show. If you and want to see what we do, our short films cuz Mike and I both write and direct, yeah. and then we have a whole team working with us Gargoyle Media with like Steve Deering, Clarence Williams, Joaquin Silva, uh Lauren Bu Buxton, Matt like all just a 
big slew of creative minds working very hard and independently to try to bring you fun, exciting horror content. And what's good about season two is is uh, season one we purged ourselves of everything that we had created up to that point because we started horror show back in 2013 and then i put a couple of short films that i made in in 2008 and 2011 but uh so we kind of purged everything we had done before that and then we did just enough productions to finish the first season and then we came along just a couple months later and started this season two everything in season two is, is brand original new, we just did it this year brand new 100 percent original that we wrote and directed and sometimes the shorts that you're watching were just written and directed and filmed and edited just the week before. So it's it's it. I'm sure it's kind of entertaining for some people to just to see how we survive this. Yes, <laughs> with no money. So, like I said, and it's in the description of the podcast. I'm going to put a little description of how you could watch our show and where it's at. So please check us out. And like I said, send us your fucking submissions. We want to put your voice out there. We want to give a uh, reach a hand out to the horror community. We want your work to be seen. We fucking love doing this. This yeah, is why we do this because we love it. It's not like we're sitting on top dealing out the 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 exposure for everyone we're small filmmakers just like you guys but we got ourselves a little uh, we got ourselves a bit of an audience and it's yeah. a worldwide audience and it's a chance for you to spread your name out even a little more yeah, and and i always knew once i got a little bit of exposure a little bit of recognition then i would take that and start bringing up other filmmakers and i really hope that this uh, special that we do every month achieves that Yes. So check out the Ghost Manor Vera specials. They come once a month for our variety show. And check out our show every Friday night. Like we, like we said, it's we have short films, skits, uh, interviews, uh, podcast highlights. We have a whole plethora of content. Some of our shorts are serious. Some of them are goofy. Some of them are admittedly openly dumb and goofy. Some of us are just having fun. Yeah. Some of them are a little more serious. But like I said, it's a variety show, so there's a good range of different types of horror on there. And you never know what you're going to get. Yes, so please check us out. And also listen to our podcast every Saturday. Available, yep. well, obviously, if you're listening to this, you know where it's available at. <laughs> we keep saying this and we apologize. We will get it to Spotify soon. Yes. We need to get it out to Spotify. So our horror variety show on American Horrors every Friday and podcast every Saturday. And we would like to thank everyone who has listened to us so far because we're having a blast. You've made it so worth it. We wanted to thank the audience, the people who tune in every week to our show, the people who listen to our podcast, the people who send us submissions. We love you guys. And we are busting our ass to deserve you. So yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Well, until next week, happy horror. Happy horror, everyone. <laughs>